Hey there, everyone. Today I wanna to go over, kind of introduce a new series. We're gonna call it the Challenges series. We just did the system overview. Now we're gonna actually start going into the challenges. So uh, in this video, I wanna go over aquaponic challenges. So let's get started. So one of the first decisions that we had to make is how to handle the fish tanks. And obviously, if, you, if you've been following around for a while, you know that we put them down in the ground, which is what you're seeing down here behind me. Uh, all the fish tanks are down there, but we had a decision of putting them up top as well. Uh, majority of all the systems that I've seen online or that other people have done, their aquaponic tanks were actually all above ground. Um, this was a problem for us. The challenge was that that took up valuable growing space. Uh, and we wanted to try to optimize the amount of space uh, that we could have for growing versus having extra tanks and stuff uh, sitting around for um, the fish and taking up valuable space. So when we did our initial experiment up in the office, uh, we actually did the aquarium on the bottom, grow bed on the top, and then light going across that. And that exact design is what we put in out here. It worked very well, um, but it does have its challenges. And one of those challenges are that you gotta get the fish waste up out of the bed. And we kinda touched on that a little bit in a previous video where I did some experimentation with a pump or a water wheel type of idea there a subscriber had. And uh, we gotta get the fish waste up from the bottom of the tanks, uh, underneath the ones that go down the ground. Now those tanks are three feet deep by two feet wide. That's about a meter uh, deep by, what is it? Three quarters of a meter, uh, two thirds of a meter. Uh, wide. So that's still a challenge that we, we have to face. We've got to come up with a way to get that waste out of there, but it's a good trade still. I'm very happy with what we did. These tanks down the ground really helped regulate the temperature. We went through 100 plus uh, Fahrenheit degrees this summer and the water never got hotter than 70 Fahrenheit. That's really good. That's pushing it for the trout, but they're, they're kind of used to it. Uh, they can handle that in this environment uh, as long as the beds are um, moving the water, which is the key thing that we have to have is you have to have the grow beds uh, dumping their water uh, pretty much every hour so that that water stays oxygenate, oxygenated. Excuse me. Uh, so that's uh, one of the first major challenges we had there. I'm kneeling at the, the start of lane two here. Uh, this is the lane that has the most sensors on it right now so we can actually kind of track everything. And one of the problems with aquaponics is energy. Actually, that's pretty much a, power, a problem with everything. Uh, when I did all my analyses, the fundamental problem with no matter how you want to do sustainable agriculture, uh, which means energy and fuel, you, you, it just requires power. If you want to be able to grow all year round, you need power. If you want to be able to control your environment, you need power. If it's too hot, you need to cool, you need power. If it's too warm and you need to heat, you need power. Now, however you want to bring that power in, whether it's through burning something like propane or uh, solar, electricity, wind, all those things, it's a big problem. And with aquaponics, you have lights uh, and you have pumps and those things require power. So whenever you're doing any automation, or I'm sorry, any aquaponic design, you need to make sure you really consider your power consumption and available power. Well, two more problems that we had uh, with this system is shading. Uh, this is the north side of the building, and as things grow towards the south, uh, we're going to get some shading. You also have shading due to the fact that we want to do vertical farming. So you need to have more LED lights. That means more power, right? So that's a major consideration is how you set up everything and, and being considerate of your shading. Another challenge that we have is actually getting to the rainbow trout to breed. Now, we chose rainbow trout for a few reasons, but number one and foremost, I don't like tilapia. <laughs> Uh, they might be good for aquaponics, uh, but they're not really great to eat. At least I don't enjoy them. So I wanted to have a fish that I actually enjoyed consuming, uh, a fish that can also handle the colder weather up here. Right now the, the tanks uh, are sitting at a perfect 56 degrees Fahrenheit. The trout are happy. Life is good. So kind of a nice cold water fish uh, for where we live in the northern latitudes. That's, that's a good thing. Um, We've talked about fish food. I mean, that, that is another challenge is how to get good fish food. And, and we looked around in a lot of different places and we chose to go with spreading fish food I talked about before. Uh, hopefully this year though, we can really address maybe growing our own fish food in a few different ways, like uh, verma, composting, 
uh, with red wigglers or doing the black, uh, black soldier fly larvae uh, is another option that we have. Uh, the primary one that we experimented with before was little red minnows. And if, if you could get the red minnows to breed, then uh, you know, they're plant eaters. So you could basically uh, just keep them off into a separate tank and grow as many as you need. Uh, as long as they're pumping out babies, uh, you're good to go, you know, because you could throw in a bunch of algae that you could grow very easily in here. That was the original plan, in fact, uh, for this space behind me. And so algae gets eaten by minnows, minnows get eaten by uh, the fish, uh, their trout, and then you could feed the digestate from the digester into the algae tank. And now that's where you're bringing in your external minerals and um, other uh, nutritional value type of stuff. Uh, and that all is getting transferred into your system. So it'd be a nice natural cycle. Um, speaking of breeding, a uh, challenge that we have right now uh, is getting the rainbow trout to breed. We haven't really uh, broached the topic yet. I mean, we, we went to our local fish hatchery run by the state and they walked us through uh, how they do everything. It, and it's quite overwhelming when you read about it, but then when you see them do it, you're like, oh. Essentially, you, you have to round up the trout and then uh, you have to knock, you know, however you, you do that, you knock them out or you trap them or whatever, but usually you want to knock them out so they're not flailing around and they hurt themselves. Uh, and there's a few different natural chemicals you can use to do that. And you get them and essentially you run your uh, hand down their stomach and whether it's both the male or the female, uh, you're basically milking them for their eggs and for their sperm. Put that into a bucket, stir the bucket. I'm oversimplifying this and then you lay out the eggs in a nice little incubation chamber, keep it dark, keep it the right temperature, fresh water, and then the eggs start to hatch and you have yourself baby trout. Um, the cool thing about trout is each hen, uh, which is the female fish, um, can have, I think it's 750 to 1300 eggs. So even if you have 50% loss, which uh, we thought would be kind of realistic and we come to find out that's actually totally unrealistic, um, they only get about 10% loss from at the hatchery from hatching all the way through final harvest. So uh, you can still stick with 50% loss and you still have a ton of baby fish, right? So very sustainable. Um, and that's where we want to get to is be able to breed them, but we got to figure out how to round up the trout. Just like when you have cattle, uh, you have to sit there and you have to, well, you don't sit there. You get on a horse or you get on a quad or whatever. You go out there and you have to round up your cows and bring them in the stockyard. Well, you got to do the same thing with the trout. You got to somehow round them all up, get them out of these pens into a hatchery area, uh, or you got to do something else. Got some crazy ideas there. Anyway, there's another problem for you. Now, if you were to look at a commercial facility for aquaponics or hydroponics, you're not really going to see the media beds like what we have here. There's different types of ways that you can do aquaponics. Uh, one of them is a deep water culture or floating raft system where you kind of have something very similar like a 12 inch deep uh, floating or area that's filled with water and then you have floats in them that have little uh, holes drilled out and you set little uh, caskets down there and then you have your plants growing in there. And all your commercial facilities are gonna be using a system like that, the floating raft, deep water culture systems. And we looked at that the, the challenge with the deep water culture or the floating raft systems uh, is they're made for uh, short statured plants. So these are like your lettuces, things that don't get very tall, but we wanted to grow a whole bunch of different things. And so that means you need something for the roots to be able to grab hold of. That puts you into a media bed. Or you could do a whole bunch of crazy thing with the roots, you know, uh, structuring, uh, trellising, you can hold the plants up that way. That's a lot of extra work that is not something we're looking at. So we'd prefer to go with the more natural way where the roots actually establish themselves in a media. Uh, when we first looked at uh, what media to go with, a very common one is uh, like pea gravel or a granite uh, type of gravel. Um, the problem with pea gravel, it's really heavy, really, really heavy. Uh, it's a solid rock, not very porous, not a lot of places for the uh, uh, bacteria that you need in the grow bed to actually take hold. Uh, the problem with granite is that it can have limestone in it, which means you're constantly chasing your pH. So we chose to go with an inert lava rock, and we live in the northwest. Uh, 
the ring of fire is here. So Ravalock is very readily available and uh, pretty inexpensive compared to those other options as well. It's lighter, so you don't have as much weight in this bed. Um, and it's very porous, so you have a lot of area, uh, a lot of surface area for the bacteria that you need uh, to get a hold of. So another uh, reason why we chose to go with uh, the deep, or I'm sorry, the media bed is because when we do get the fish waste up out of here, you got to do something with that waste. And in your normal commercial system, they'd have uh, filters and mineralization tanks that help deal with those solids. Uh, for us, the media bed is our filter. So as soon as we get the fish manure up into the bed, uh, good things start to happen there. Uh, but they can turn bad if there's a lot of waste. So your stocking density is very important. Right now we're really low uh, level stocking density, but as it increases, because we want to start breathing out the fish, then you actually have to have a way to start dealing with some of those solids. So we actually put red wigglers inside of this bed here to help deal with those solids. And if we dig deep enough, I've changed them out. I think we brought in two shipments of red wigglers so far because we killed the first one. <laughs> uh, but I've actually found them in the system. So they're pretty happy little critters in there. As long as your water levels are all good, enter the bell siphons and all the problems we've had with that. Well, to date, we really, we don't have enough lessons learned to really uh, pass on yet with aquaponics because we haven't been able to focus on it. We've been building this facility. Uh, we did our initial experiments. We've had plants in here. We've removed all plants now uh, due to the fungus problem that we're having. We just wanted to start nice and fresh with everything. Uh, sterilized everything, sprayed it down with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and we're getting ready with the Real Martian Challenge to actually choose our first plants. I'm gonna talk about that in another video. Uh, but we will have a lot of stuff to share as far as our trials and tribulations with aquaponics and yes, I got potatoes. We're gonna try it, see how it goes. Uh, I think with the lava rock, which we've seen actually allows us to grow carrots. We grew carrots last year. Uh, they came out kind of short, but they look like normal carrots. And honestly, I think they would have turned out better if we had the watering and the lighting uh, situation really a little more dialed in like what we're going to have this year. So uh, looking forward to actually having some good lessons to pass on to you there. It's gonna be exciting this year. So uh, following the real Martian challenge, it's gonna be cool. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, just going over challenges with our aquaponic system, where we're at so far. Again, kind of at the beginning stages, so not a lot of share yet, but this year should be full of fun and excitement as we get it all online. We're hoping you can walk in here and eventually it'll look like the Garden of Eden, where you basically don't see any of this metal anymore because there's plants everywhere, uh, trellising plants. Someone actually brought up the idea of maybe having hops run up these. I love that idea. I think that's fantastic. Uh, a little IPA hop action. Oh, oh, that sounds good. Anyway, hey, thanks for following along. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe. Don't forget, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and on Patreon. In the meantime, everyone, this is The Real Martian, out.